Hey, what's up, you sexy bitches, and welcome to this week's Weekly D. I'm so excited to have you with me, and I'm excited to have our guest, Nada, also known as Hijabalicious, who I, for some reason, keep saying Hijabalicious. I don't know why I keep saying Hijabalicious. It's Hijabalicious. So if I do say it wrong in the episode, I do apologize. Um, Nada, thank you so much for coming on to this show. It was great to have spoken to you, and I learned a lot of stuff, and I know that you are all going to learn lots of stuff as well. So without further ado, this is the week. Weekly D, because honey, if you ain't getting your D on the daily, you better at least begin it once on the weekly. If you're not getting any and you want some tea, then come and join Dan up on the weekly D. It's the weekly D. Hey Neda, thank you for joining me on my podcast. It's so nice to have you on here and I'm super excited to talk to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm excited to talk to you too. <laughs> thank you, by the way, for doing this so early. Can you just tell everyone what time it is there at the moment? Um, it's 7.38 a.m. Oh, are you a morning person or is this pretty early for you? You know what? Um, I work so like this is standard for me and plus Friday is a delayed start. So right. that, yeah, so I'm using my delayed start time to do this interview, which I'm happy to do. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, this was a podcast I wanted to do because I feel like so many podcasts are they ask me to do interview and I'm like, I don't no, like I don't feel like it. There's other ways I want to spend my time. So Oh wow, I feel so honored. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um I'm just super excited to learn more about you and just learn just more about your social media presence and just like Everything about you, I think you're just such a great person and I love your social media page. So I just wanted to see past kind of hijabalicious and um, kind of get to know Nada really. Um, so before we start, um, can you give us like, I always ask people to give like a little bit of a bio, a little intro, tell people about you, who you are, what you do, just so that people who maybe don't know you can learn a little bit about you. So my name's Neda. Um, I was uh, born in the US. My background is Iranian. Um, I'm 34 and my day job is a nurse practitioner and before that I was a labor and delivery nurse uh, for six years before I became an NP. Oh wow, okay, so so you've been a nurse for quite a long time, so what sort of, um, this is a really stupid question probably, but like when you say nurse, is that a speciality that you work within, like maternity or is it like, is it everything? Well, when I was a bedside nurse, um, so at least in the U.S., once you become an RN, you have a lot of opportunities after that once you have experience doing bedside, which is what I had. Um, so when I was a bedside nurse, which means I worked in the hospital and did direct patient care, um, my specialty was in labor and delivery because to be a maternity nurse, you have to have extra training by the hospital. Right. So once you come out of school, you got to be in a labor and delivery program for six months um just because like there's a, a lot of independence that comes with that job um you have to make a lot of decisions about people's uh, managing people's birth um, okay there's a lot of safety to consider um there's a lot of uh, dangerous situations that you have to know how to navigate um, i can imagine yeah so you know i really miss um what i did in in that environment because there's a lot of emergencies that come up there's a lot of fast thinking um there is no in between either you have a very uh um uneventful delivery or chaotic so yeah. <laughs> um but you know i mean there's a lot of politics here that comes with being a bedside nurse and uh when i got tired of the hospital i worked for i used their union benefit to put me back in school and i got my nurse practitioner I took their money and left. Um, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, so now I do mostly general medicine and then um, a lot of uh, gyne health, like pap smears, preventative care. So it's it's a lot more calm, but I'm happy with my job. Nice. Oh, oh, so you are happy with your job. And I only say it's because um, you are very vocal on your social media page about what it's like working within the healthcare profession. So even though it's a very, by, by what it sounds like on your social media, it sounds very stressful and a lot of pressure on a lot of nurses. It's the, very much the same here. Um, you still really enjoy it. 
Well, yeah, because I mean, I was first working as a, as a nurse practitioner in another job. And I think that especially during pandemic, um, it's, it was easy to brush off a lot of like poor treatment, for example, because you're like, well, at least I have a job. Um, right. Because even healthcare workers were getting laid off in certain areas. And um, you just think, well, everybody has a bad. Why is my situation any different? So you build a tolerance. And I think that with that tolerance, I was tolerating what I shouldn't have tolerated, um, which is that if you are the hardest worker that doesn't question what's going on, they give you the most work. And that's uh, what happened to me. So when I started seeing that, like, hey, wait, pandemic numbers are getting better. Why are y'all still acting like this? Um, I one day, uh, they pissed me off one day and um, they pissed away. My breaking point was, was they made me go to a staff meeting during my lunch break. And they only provided pork sandwiches. And because I'm Muslim, I do not eat pork. And I'm like, y'all, I've been working here four years. You couldn't even think to give me a sandwich that I could eat. And it wasn't the fact that they were giving me 30 patients a day. It wasn't that, you know, um, uh, they were not like approving my vacation time. The breaking point was, was y'all didn't even consider me when getting food options in a mandatory meeting. So I applied somewhere else in a rage and I, <laughs> <laughs> I went to indeed.com on company time and I updated my resume and then I got an interview and I was just like, eh, I don't know if I should go to this interview because I applied in a rage, but I was just like, hey, why not? And I really like the place. So I quit. I went on vacation <laughs> at my old job and I just didn't come back. Um, <laughs> wow. And, and you're happy where you are now? Oh, I love my job now. Um, I realized that uh, it doesn't always have to be this way. I think that some hospitals, I think that some health organizations have taken advantage of the fact that, well, everybody has a shitty time right now. What are you going to do? Um, right. And so um, I realized, I'm like, no, it doesn't have to be like this. Uh, yeah. So it just can provide you resources that you need. Stop it. Um <laughs> <laughs> For anyone who isn't watching, Ned has got a cat that is desperate to be on camera today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, I realized that like some places like my current job, they can provide you the resources. It's just that a lot of places choose not to because right. if you are a hard worker um, that does not complain, which was me, um, I thought that it was a valuable asset to not complain. It was not. Um they just take advantage. Yeah. <laughs> they just date like. <laughs> this cat is too cute. <laughs> what is this cat's name? This one's Toasty. How um, many cats do you have? I have four. It was not intentional, but like. <laughs> <laughs> is it ever intentional? Yeah. I don't think any of my pets, I don't think any of them have been really intentional. They kind of just come about at the time. Yeah, just, um, they just kind of found a way to my home and I couldn't say goodbye. So here uh... I am. That's but, super um, cute. <laughs> but yeah, so, as far huh? Go on. So no, I was just going to say, so how do you find the crossover between, because yeah, you've kind of got three big crossovers and I kind of love it. It's one of the things that I really love about how open you are about it and how um, kind of, I hope you don't mind me saying like zero fucks attitude towards it. It's like, yes, I can be a Muslim woman. Yes, I can be a pole dancer. Yes, I can teach in a hospital environment. And these can all come inside absolutely fine. How do you find, how do you find that balance? Like, and do you, are you just a case of like, listen, if you don't like it, it's absolutely tough. Your problem, not mine. I think it came with age because I'm 34. And I think that like, um, I think with just how social media is, we see a lot of how people develop now, right? We right. see where people... We see people's developmental stages like, you know, early 20s, mm -hmm. right? I was not like this in my early 20s and it's not documented. You know, I think that like on TikTok and Instagram, you're seeing how people so use social media as a part of their development. You see like you can call you can see when someone's being immature. You can see when someone has not developed a sense of identity yet. You right. know, um, I think that naturally, like in my early 20s, like I don't know how I would have presented myself. If I had Instagram or TikTok at that time, all we had was Facebook um, and LiveJournal. LiveJournal was a big one. Um, you know, so I think that the attitude came over time, just having worked in healthcare, um, especially. I think that you have to develop thicker skin 
anyway. And I think it's just understanding that if people are going to, because I was harassed my first year of nursing. I had a very hard time my first year of nursing. And I had a rude awakening that um, a lot of people are going to um, hate you for the sake of hating you. And they need a scapegoat. So I think after that experience, I just kind of learned that, like, if, if people want to put a target on your back, they will. Right. You just have to be at the wrong place, wrong time. I think that a lot of people, because they were the popular, pre they were the popular person in high school, because they don't know what it's like to be yeah. unpopular and uh, just have a target on your back arbitrarily. Um, right. They don't understand that hate is not always earned, that sometimes mm. they just will. So I just figured with time, I'm like, well, if y'all are going to try to talk shit about someone, which is usually me, um, I will give you some to talk about uh, because I cannot control who you decide to target. So I'm just going to do what I want. So, yeah, because <laughs> I was so, not the popular person in high school. I was not the popular person at my job. Um, I worked in a racist ass like environment when I was at uh, my first year of nursing. So that was a rude ass awakening. Um, you know, and I think also what helps is that like, I was just kind of born into when I was a kid, like there's a lot of stuff in my identity that did not match up with everyone else around me. I grew up with a brother who had um, considered to have like very severe autism because he was nonverbal. He was diagnosed uh. in the early 90s. And that's when they didn't know what autism was. Mm -hmm. And I was as a kid, like, um, I was just I just saw his behaviors that are considered socially unacceptable as normal. You know, so I was just used to everybody looking at us like you can't be self-conscious when you are raised with somebody who has behaviors that are considered not socially as very acceptable. Um, so I guess I just developed a high tolerance from that, too. Right. And do you ever get any problems with um, family, friends, people from maybe your religious groups or anything have any issue with your social media presence or your pole dancing or anything like that? Have you ever experienced anything like that? Or do you get any other Muslim women maybe? I just wanted more from the lines of maybe not people even you know, like maybe other Muslim women who come to your page and try to give you any like, we'll call it feedback rather than hate, shall we? But like saying things like, oh, this is bad for whatever reason. Do you ever get anything like that? Many times, like when I, because I was oh, not- really? Yeah, especially when I first started. And again, I think that because I have a higher following, I had to get used to this very quickly. Because when I first started posting to poll for poll, I didn't think anything of it. I just didn't understand the implications of being public on Instagram. Um, I didn't like I it just didn't occur to me. So when I was like taking my private lessons in 2019, and I was posting it because I was like, hey, look at how strong I am. You know, um, I ended up uh, one of my videos went viral and then I started having like these men from middle of ass nowhere, Egypt start messaging me, um, and start telling me that like, you know, I'm going to hell, blah, blah, blah. But like, I mean, it's nothing. Of unique. course, of course it was men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, of course, I think that in every culture and it's not unique to just Muslims, I think that there's always going to be these angry ass men that don't like it that I'm doing something for myself. And then you're going to have like the Aunt Lydia types that are going to have internalized patriarchy. This is nothing new to me. Um, I mm. just saw them as they're all following a certain formula. And the block button is right there. Um, and then I learned how to expose people. And that was fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, so. I took a long time to really be comfortable using the block button. I felt like if I was blocking so many people, like maybe it was an indication that I was the problem. And I realized that actually it wasn't really that deep. It was more just a case of, do you know what? We don't vibe. So let's just end this here. Because especially when it's people that you're probably never going to see, right? You're probably never going to see them again. <laughs> so yeah. I was just a bit like, let's just use that button and just be done with it. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, and do you, do you, um, practice your, with your religion? Like, um, do you, uh, practice the religion like quite heavily or would you say you're more relaxed Muslim or? Well, it depends who you ask. 
right? Um, because, like, you know, I have a complicated history with, like, my, my faith as well, um, because I'm honest about that. Mm. I think that especially, you know, and, I, and I'm open about this, too. I have not talked to my parents in three years. I don't intend to because I okay. grew up, yeah, I grew up under, um, I didn't leave the house until I was 29, and I did not cut contact until like three years ago. And that's how I immersed myself in pole was um, the same month that I cut contact is the same month that I decided to try pole because like I was like, well, um, I, when you're in when you're in that mindset, you're like, I ain't got nothing to lose. Like, was it almost like a freeing experience? You felt kind of maybe free from that situation. I think that it was always on my mind to try pole because the studio is a mile from me and I just wanted to try something new as well because like my, my original sport is swimming. I tried my first pole class a week after a race that I had in the ocean that was two miles long. Um, so oh. I got my best time possible and I was like, well, I've peaked in this for now, so I'm going to try something different for a couple of <laughs> weeks. So, um, and here you are, like yeah. <laughs> super famous on Instagram for being hijabalicious. How did, by the way, that name, what a great name, by the way. <laughs> how right. did you, how did you even just come up with the name? Did you just think, well, I wear a hijab, so I'm a bit hijabalicious? Or is that like, to, who even helped you with that name? Or did you just think of it yourself? Another, it was another black woman that helped me with that name because I was like, hey, uh, hijabalicious is taken. What do I do now? And she was like, oh just add luscious and i was like that's cool um so i'm gonna take that like <laughs> i love it yeah, yeah it's such such a great idea and the the things that you've achieved with your platform you've got like a decent following on your social media platform now um is that kind of something that you intended to do or did it kind oh, yeah, of just real, happen real quick, I Real quick, I don't. I don't think I answered your question about being a relaxed Muslim. I, I kind of went on a tangent here. So oh, to, go on, yeah, go on. Yeah. No, please answer it. Yeah. So to answer your question, what kind of Muslim I am? Like, oh my god, what the hell? Um, <laughs> okay. Those so, cats are causing yeah. like they're, they're not happy about this conversation. They're like, if no. you chat to him, I'm gonna distract all your house. <laughs> yeah, they don't like it that I'm giving someone else attention. Um, anyway. So to answer your question, whether like what kind of Muslim I consider myself. So as far as in practice, I pray five times a day. You know, I decided to cover my hair when I was 21 and um, I fast for Ramadan. And, you know, I I mean, it, it's some, being Muslim is something I incorporate in my life every day. And I try to incorporate it with my actions as well, like charity, you know, um, just thinking about like um, like pleasing God if I do like good deeds and mm -hmm. just just working towards a higher purpose like that's the part that means a lot to me but i think whether you want to so the whole like um is how strict of a muslim you are how orthodox i think that's that's something that people have created over time like the spectrum because like in the, in the quran there's not really that that spectrum doesn't really exist it's you you know um it's just like you believe in the faith or you're totally against it right, right? Um, and usually even in the context of the Quran, the disbelievers are the people in that time that were, um, trying to conquer the Muslims. Right. So even in that context is heavily misinterpreted, but anyway, um, as far as the complicated relationship with my faith, again, my, both my parents are Muslim and they're, they're from Iran that already introduces complications, um, as far as how I saw my faith, but you know, um, I went no contact with them for reasons completely unrelated to pole. People assume that um, me starting pole dancing is why my parents don't talk to me or why I chose not to talk to them. Um, right. And I'm like, that is some, no, like, um, <laughs> you know, because actually what people don't know is my mom did not want me to start covering my hair. That was one of our biggest fights because she did, she was totally against me wearing hijab, period. Why, um, why is that? What, I think why? if you're, I think if you're from Iran, which is what what we are seeing right now, and what I heavily advocate for on my page right now, is that the hijab is was used as a, is used as a tool of oppression in Iran. People don't have the choice to wear it or not, and so it's probably what my mom associated with. Um, Iran is uh, it, next to Afghanistan is one of is they're they're the only Muslim countries that do not give you a choice to wear hijab, and. There's a lot of atrocities going on in Iran right now. The government killing its own people. Um, 
So I totally support people burning their hijab in Iran because it is a sign of oppression. Um, but again, like I'm, I'm practicing my faith in, um, I have the privilege of practicing in a place where I have the choice to learn on my own. I'm not learning Islam through some, you know, some, what the government, um, enforces. So, exactly. and I'm, yeah, and I was born in the U S I'm sure that if I was born in Iran, I would see things differently. Um, right. So, and I'm fine with that. Um, but yeah, like when I started coal, I immersed myself into it because when you grow up in, uh, in, in a place where there's a lot of like emotional abuse, psychological abuse and so on, you lose a lot of your bodily autonomy. And I think that, um, you know, religiously, like I'm sexually very conservative. I practice the whole waiting until marriage thing. And, um, and I totally support people that did not like I, I do like my job is like I, I, I if people were, were waiting until marriage, I would not have a job like. <laughs> right. Of know, course. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I totally support like safe sex. I'm pro very pro choice, you know, um, but for myself, I'm very much on the conservative side. Mm. Um, but I love I that about you. I love the fact that you are very like like you're honest about the fact that that's not for me but i'm very you know i'm very happy for people who would like to do that like the pro-choice comment you made i like the fact that you do that and you're very open about that you know do, i wish there was more people that were able to be like that do you find and again kind of a maybe a bit of an odd question here um i sometimes when i say to people um well i don't you know really support that myself but i support you doing it it's not for me but you know i i fully support you and sometimes people be like well why, why don't you agree with that point and, and they try to f almost force it upon you like and you were just mentioning and i again i hope you don't mind me asking i just wondered mm -hmm. if there again was any maybe iranian women or who had said to you like you need to burn your hijab uh, in support or anything like that have you ever had anything like that where people have been like they tried to force that opinion on you oh all the time i mean with with the uh... <laughs> Shit, like even before this whole situation, I live in Los Angeles, so like, you know, there is like a like um, a big Iranian population here, and they all assume that I'm Arab, and sometimes they talk shit to me in Farsi that they think that I don't understand what they're saying. I've especially by older women, I've been told if you want to wear that thing, go go back home. Like they sound like Trump supporters in Farsi. Like Iranians have a long ass history of their own racism. And like, you know, white supremacy and shit. Mm. Um, and like, it, you know, pe people who are oppressed can still ha can still internalize a lot of racism, you know, um, especially when they come here. So, you know, and I tell them to politely fuck off in Farsi, um, you know, but it's happened several times. And um, and I just and I, I respond accordingly. But I think that. It's not just Iranians that will do this. I think that to answer your question about people need to feel like their decisions are fully validated by you and that if you're not partaking in the same, it, you, you have something against it. Right. right. Yeah, it's exactly. It's almost like just because you don't believe in it or choose to partake in something, that all of a sudden it means that you are against it and therefore the problem, you know? And I, I hate that. I, do you find that's more of an internet thing? Do you ever get people like that face to face? Because I definitely don't. I mean, obviously I'm talking about completely different other subjects here, but you know, it could be anything, whether it be like homophobia, like someone could say online and be like, well, you know, I don't really agree, you know, with a man being with a man, but I support your decision. If someone said that online, oh, that would be a yeah. big, that would be like, oh my God, you're cancelled. But if someone came to me and said, well, listen, I really support you and Mitch. You're both great guys. Love you both. But, you know, for me, I don't believe in the relationship between a man and a man, but I fully support you. I'd be like, great, thanks. Like, you know, don't get me wrong. It's not something I agree with either, but we can still co coexist and, you know, uh, I feel like I feel crazy saying that because I know there's people out there that are like, why would you be friendly to someone who doesn't support same sex relationships? I'd be like, well, you know, I, I could, I could be the same. Maybe I could be so far to the point where I'm like, oh, I don't like 
<laughs> opposite sex relationships you know what I mean it's like I'm not but it's like if I was I'd hope they'd respect that decision but it's yeah. just I find it's more of an internet issue do you find that you get more of these issues on the internet yes and I think that that's what I mean is with um with social media um and people's development I think that because everybody wants validation everybody I think there's a lot of room to be extremely sanctimonious online um and I think that now People see it as like if you're not validating their your their decisions, you're against it. Right. Um, you know. So I mean, I think that also we there's no room for people to develop their ideas over time, because I grew up in an extremely homophobic environment. Like, um, uh. my parents were. I mean, I like you know even though I'm a straight woman, like I mean when I was 14, um, you know it was just like girls will make like suggestive comments to each other. And that was one of that was a clear memory of physical abuse um, that resulted when my parents found out the exchanges between me and my 14 year old friend in eighth grade. And um, and I think that and I, I mean, I was against gay marriage until that that year, you know, um, like I really well, I mean, I was a teenager, but again, I was t t taking in the opinions of my parents. Right. Hmm. So. Um, you know, I really did think that like um, being pro gay marriage was like a, some agenda or some shit, right? Um, but I think that when I experienced violence, like homophobic ass violence, um, being a straight woman, I was like, just I, I think I that's when I really started being against my parents' beliefs, because I was just like, I'm not even gay, and y'all are acting like this. Right. I see. Okay. You know, and I mean, I think that some people like they were probably raised with beliefs that, you know, it just, it just takes time, um, for them to, um, I mean, I think like that's what my platform does as well as because like, there's probably a lot of people against hijab, you know, um, against anybody wearing it because it's of what they associate it with. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think that when people see me wearing hijab and doing what I want and not allowing people with really shitty ass opinions to control, um, my beliefs and, um, I, it gives other people permission to do the same. And okay. I think that especially with being on the internet, um, I think that what helped me is, uh, I was in therapy at the same time that I started pole because I had just went no contact. I was doing regular therapy like weekly cause I needed it. And uh, my therapist is Muslim herself and she has a strong social media presence. And when I was getting harassed, she reminded me that like, you know, if these people said these things to your face, you'd either punch them or walk away. So why do they get to do that to you online? Um, you don't let other people, you don't let other people uh, who know you personally talk to you that way. So why do mm. they get to do that? And that's, well, that's what really put I, an even head on my shoulders. I always see your um, comments back to when people maybe disagree or whatever. And you're so like, especially as well, because you always engage normally with Tuesday topics. Thank you for that, by the way. Mm. Um, and you always keep such a calm state of mind. And I admire you for that because sometimes when people comment stupid stuff or they say things that are really mean or horrible, you've got a way of responding but not being angry. And I re like, how do you do that? <laughs> because I um, need to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up with a mom that has undiagnosed mental conditions. Like, <laughs> yeah, <you> know, right. <laughs> um, I mean, I just grew up, uh, I mean, shit. I think also just like patient care. Right. Oh, okay. You know, with like if, if you've been abused at bedside before, if you've been um, people, I mean, also people are just emotionally charged when they come in to deliver babies. Like they're in extreme pain. Right. Um, I'm going to get cussed at sometimes. And I just have to take a step back and be like, okay, customer service voice. Because that's the best way to diffuse, diffuse a situation. So when I'm responding, I am making it very clear I'm not engaging with you if you're going to have that tone with me. So yeah. I'm going to redirect. So I think I'm just using something that I just use to deal in volatile situations. Yeah, for sure. So 
how do you get along with um because i know you've been using the um i don't know what they're called i think it might be called like gecko grip leggings and the like the grip leggings and stuff and you pull fully clothed how how do you get on with that like how do you get along with the like fully clothed situation is that really hard when it's warm i assume because it gets pretty hot in la right <laughs> well real quick before i get to that i do want to just because this is i think that this is an important thing to add with my pole journey is that mm. i said uh you know about like traditionally there's a lot of things that i follow um when it comes to sexuality and i you know by the time that i started pole i was i i'd already been with my partner for a few years so right. i think a lot of people when they think about bodily autonomy they think about whole phase and whole phase it uh, works for a lot of people you know <laughs> um <laughs> and that's cool if they find their autonomy that way but for me, like, even if I was single, there was no, I just whole phase did not appeal to me for religious reasons. And also this just, just not, just, it's just not me. Um, but there's other ways to reclaim your bodily autonomy that don't involve sex with men necessarily. And, um, and that's what pole did for me was that when I immersed myself in it, I needed something different that was going to like snap me out of like all the shit that I was processing that year. And I needed just something that was really out of my comfort zone. And um, it, it, I don't want to say that pole is extreme, but because my usual sport is swimming, I just needed something that I was just like, I really need a distraction. So when I started going to private lessons, when I started going to like the pole classes more regularly, that's what started helping me claim my autonomy. And it's not just the sexual aspect of it, because again, for me, for the more sensual stuff, like I would keep that private. Um, that was not something I wanted to post publicly because it's just like I, uh, it's just something I want to experience privately. But mm -hmm. when uh, even for like you know the the that's just the strong girl stuff like the more the more gymnastic acrobatic element that really helped claim my bodily autonomy because when you grow up in the environment that I did, you don't trust yourself. You learn to not trust your instincts. You don't trust what your body is telling you. Um, and you, in turn, lose a lot of your bodily autonomy. With pole, because you have to have so much bodily awareness and because there's a lot of danger that comes with pole, uh, you have to learn how to trust and listen to your body. Mm -hmm. And you have to trust it when it says you're going to rest today. And um, you have to trust it whenever you're upside down. And you really have to trust your instincts in pole. And I think like that's what's really had me stick to it is just the kind of lessons about my body I needed to relearn on my terms. I love that. Uh, yeah, I love that. That thought of, like you said, claiming that sort of like that energy through pole rather than, you know, ho phase. I love that. I guess so many people probably don't even think about it that way. I And I had never even thought of it that way until you literally just said it then. And how old were you at this point when you started pole? That was, uh, I was 31, so I'm 34 okay. now, so I've been polling three years now. And uh, you started in LA? You, you live in LA, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started in the, in a North Hollywood studio that's a mile from me, and I and I just saw it show up in ClassPass. Um, I think that if there was a gymnastics studio, I probably would have tried that, but pole is the closest I could get to it, so. Right, mm-hmm. And... How did that how did that experience go down at first? Because you haven't discovered like I asked a minute ago, I'll ask again in a second, but the um you know, the grippy leggings and stuff. You haven't discovered all of this yet. So do you contact the students and say, Hey, just let you know, I need to stay fully clothed for this. What's my options here? How how did they respond to that? Well, when I when I first started I was level one, right? So even the very beginner classes, they didn't require much grip. Because right. you're doing like fireman spins, you know, like stuff that does not require that much grip. I was in the very basic classes. So like the leggings, even regular leggings were not an issue because I wasn't okay. even climbing yet. Um, but I think like when I started like treating myself to private lessons, my instructor was like, you know, uh, if you want to do grippy leggings, they, they have it. There's several brands. Just look it up. And um, it came up because I really wanted to do the 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 winter performance like the Christmas performance thing and I was only four months experienced um so that's when it came up when I was like trying to train for that and um and yeah I think doing the winter performance just being four months experience like that was 
the 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 goals that I had set that really helped me cope through my situation. Mm-hmm. And how did the winter performance go after four months? What confidence you have! I love that. So after four months of pole, I, I probably barely knew anything. I don't think I would have been even like brave enough to perform at that point. How did that go? Oh, I loved it. Um, <laughs> I think that for me. Like, I think I naturally have the performer like personality, like I was already very comfortable with things like public speaking. Um, I, um, I just I, I, you know, I even did stand up comedy a few years ago. Oh. Uh, and, yeah, when when I was not honest about my problems yet. And that's why I don't do stand up comedy anymore. Because I'm like, I have therapy now, y'all. Shit. Like, I don't feel like... <laughs> oh, my God. I love that. That's yeah. brilliant. <laughs> like, Treating um, the untreated therapy with comedy. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I was like, well, um, I'm like, I'm going to make a joke of all this painful stuff because I'm not I'm not going to admit it's painful. Um, yeah. So it's like, if I have the audience laugh with me, then, then what I'm going through is okay. And... Um, and then I think with pole, like that's why I just have so much more enjoyment with pole and performing in pole because at least I think I'm showing my authentic self and knowing what that is through pole, it gave me a lot of gratification to perform. Um, mm-hmm. If there's more opportunities to come up to perform, I would love to take it um, because it's just so fun to me. So if anyone's listening to this in the LA area and you've got any showcases coming up, Hijabalicious, put it on the list, please. (laughs) Oh, hey, babe. Sorry to interrupt. It's just me real quick. Do you ever have times where you're sat at home and you're thinking, oh, I wish my shoulder mount was stronger, or I wish I could shoulder mount, or I wish I could do an invert, or I wish I was able to do an iron X? Well, let me help you. Come over and give my online strength and conditioning program a try. This is a program you can do from the comfort of your own home. All you need is a pole and a rocking attitude and you'll be able to take class with me. We do three live classes every week and you can catch up on hundreds of videos which are already on the site. So make sure you check out the Pole Destroyers. See you there. Did you have any barriers to entry when it came to starting pole in hijab? And I asked just because I wonder whether um, the fully clothed aspect, I wonder if any studios, and I, um, that's why I'm asking you to see if there are any studios who have a class for people who do wear hijab and, and, and want to stay fully clothed, like a space for them to be able to enjoy pole the same as everybody else without having to take all their clothes off. Do you know what I mean? Is there anything like that? Or did you have any barriers to entry? Sorry, that was kind of like two questions in one. Oh, no. I mean, very century, not so much because, I mean, that's what I really loved about my studio. And that's why I kept coming back was because even though the first class was uncomfortable for me because there was like a lot of like sensual movements and stuff. And I was just like, well, um, I don't know if this is for me, but it was the fact that my instructor was so welcoming um, when she saw me. She was like, oh, one of my sisters covers her hair. And she was and this 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 woman who's now a close friend is a former stripper. Um, and. Um, and she was just so nice and she's so welcoming. And, she's Iranian. Uh, no, my, my instructor is, a uh, her, she told me her sister was a convert, but like this, this instructor is a uh, half Japanese. Um, okay. yeah. So, you know, I really liked it. I thought it was really cool that, you know, she was a former stripper. She's all tatted up and everything. Um, <laughs> and she was just like the most body. And I mean, she has the perfect body, but she was also very like body positive positive. There was like a lot of like um, thicker people like me and even heavier than I was um, that um, she would just find ways to teach you how to pull according to your size. Um, I love that. Yeah. So and just seeing how every every everybody of different color was there that I was just like, I was like, okay, well, first class felt kind of uncomfortable, but I'm going to come back because the environment seems real cool. Um, I think the only barrier to entry that I think other pole studios need to be mindful of, and which is why I'm covered up, even if it's an all woman's open pole, is uh, I don't think people are mindful about who's in the background. And I think because uh, I do not want to end up in someone's video in the background, um, even though my studio okay. does a good job of like posting signs let's say please be mindful of who's in the background ask permission if you're going to post um you're depending on people to do that and it's not something i trust because 
Uh, right. Most I've, I've ended up in backgrounds before, like in my shorts or like, you know, um, obviously with my hair down in a two piece. And that's just not a risk I wanted to take anymore. And I think that like, right. I, Sorry, I I'm kind people... of it, just through this answer. I'm kind of learning so much. Oh, OK. So hold on. So I, I have to apologize here because I don't mm -hmm. know much about the Muslim religion. So you are allowed to wear shorts, but only if it's all women present. Yeah. So like, you know, OK. Um, I, it, it, when I first started pole, I was going to classes and that's why I, what I enjoyed about it was because I was just like, I was like, I want to wear a two piece, but like, you know, within my boundaries. Um, so that was fun going to class and being like, this is a place where I could get, a, I could wear, I could wear a cute two piece. Um, but like, there was a couple of instances where I ended up in people's backgrounds. Um, <sighs> and I was not, you know, my internet presence was not that great, but like still like, I don't, and I don't blame the other girls because like some of them just didn't know, but it's very hard to inform a whole class that like, Hey, you know, if I'm in the background, don't put me there. You know, um, I have, I have a, not for religious reasons, but I have, um, I have someone who comes to my classes who she doesn't like to be in the background of photos either. And it's because, <laughs> so she's quite like, um, Irish Catholic like so she's quite strict religious and her she doesn't want her sons to find out that she does pole it's really funny actually and um, we do laugh about it now but I always make sure when people take photos I'm like guys I'm like careful like don't get her in the background please and they're just a bit like oh and then and then she's like oh it's okay and then she's really understanding but she shouldn't really have to be because it's that whole thing of like because sometimes she'll be like oh, I'll just move out of the way and I'm a bit like no they'll move out of the way because they're taking the photos you carry on on your pole like i hate that but yeah, yeah. no it's um it's a really tough one because we do live in this like social media age so i totally get that people want to take the, the insta picture i get it but it's got to be respectful to everyone else hasn't it so i think it's got that permission's got to be there so yeah. did you stop going to group classes as a result of that no i mean i just still just wear my my wear my hijab i wear my grip leggings I just wear what I normally wear, but I don't think much about it because, like, for me, I was going to end up posting what I learned anyway. So for right. that, like, I wanted to be covered anyway. But in the beginning, when I did not know what, uh, when I had no intention of posting anything to Instagram, that's when I would go to classes in a two-piece and so on, um, which, you know, which was fun. But also, like, you know, I get real sweaty, too. So, like, it's, it's like, there's a part of me that I'm just like, well, do I want to do this in a two-piece still? Because as these moves get harder, it's like, you know, there's nothing catching my sweat. And that's what I don't understand about, like, people that are, like, in two pieces. I'm just like, I get knee sweat. I get elbow sweat. Like, I got sweat dripping down my side from my armpit and y'all are just chilling how like i don't yeah. know <laughs> <laughs> i was just saying you're in la so it gets pretty warm there right but I'm saying that yeah. uh, most of these studios are air conditioned right or no yeah they're air conditioned but like i guess i'm just a sweaty person and also i think that like you know i think that i'm just uh i think you know i mean i do shit like aisha's and all that like i'm there for the for like the, the beefcake shit like i want to do the <laughs> You know, like, I'm not there to dance all the time. Like, even though the dance is already hard, but it's like, um, I want to do the, the, the strength training, so I'm going to be sweating. So if a man turns up to the, the pole class and you're wearing full hijab, you've got your grip leggings on, you've got a, a T-shirt on, this is okay or is that not okay? Because I don't know how that one works. Well, again, it's who you ask, right? For me, I'm going to say it's okay. Right, um, okay. Because, like, I'm like, well... Uh, I mean, for me, I, w I would not go to, like, twerk class, for example, if there's men there. But it's also, like, I don't really sign up for twerk anyway because um, I, I just don't have time. For me, like, you know, I work full time and that's what comes in is that, like, you know, when I spend my time polling, it has to be very intentional. Um, I'm going there for a specific purpose. Um, and, you know, um, like I said, for me, like, I like the acrobatic element of it. So that's what I'm be focusing on. I wish I had more time for the actual dance element, like the twerk and low flow. I just don't. Um, but I mean, that's that's why my platform is controversial to a lot of people is because they feel that I should not be doing this publicly. Because even with my grip pants, um, they say that you can see my ass. And I'm like, why are you looking at my ass? Like, I don't, you know, like, um, 
they they think that a poll is inherently sexual, but it doesn't bother me because if you go on Facebook to like, you know, these predominantly like white groups where they mostly live in the South, they're also saying that children shouldn't be on poll. They look at the like Russian or like European children that are doing poll and they have their panties in a bunch. Like Yeah. That's why um the TikTok Muslim community or whatever, it doesn't intimidate me because I'm just like, well, um, a lot of y'all are doing this and it's not just my people. So anytime there's like, you know, a poll performance video going viral on Facebook of like, you know, uh, somebody doing an innocent poll routine in front of kids, um, all the adults are losing their shit. I, th- I think it doesn't matter what you do on the internet though. It's always going to upset somebody. I think to, to avoid upsetting anybody on the internet is almost impossible. I mean, do you, how do you feel about, um, how do you feel social media affects your mental health? Like what's your mental health journey and relationship with social media? Um, I still have to set boundaries. Like it looks like, you know, I stay very calm in responses, you know, um, but I also know when to stop engaging. Um, I know what kind of comments will trigger me. Um, or just like put me in a place where I don't want to be. Um, most of which probably has to do with my body. Um, because like, uh, again, like comments about my body is what I was raised with. So, I mean, you know, I'm almost 200 pounds. Like I know I'm thicker, but that doesn't bother me. It's the fact that some of the shit that I hear online is some of the stuff that I hear my mom say, and I just get mad all over again. You know, um, I'm aware of that. And so that's when I, you know, when I post on TikTok, for example, I make it a boundary not to read the comments because the reason I post on TikTok is number one, exposure, and number two, I it's monetized. So I'm just like, look, I'm here to get my paycheck. That's it. I'm not here to engage with any of you. So like, <laughs> you so know. how is TikTok monetized? Is it monetized and you get, you have people sponsor you to wear their stuff or something or no, you get and paid per view? Instagram, it's the same with Instagram reels is that when they see that, you know, your uh, following is going up. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know their formula for Instagram, but for Instagram, like I do get paid for views. I don't get paid much, but it's enough to pay for like new kitchenware, for example, like, um, or, you know, it's enough to pay for my sticky leggings. Same thing with TikTok. TikTok pays in pennies, but you know, the pennies add up. And, you know, if I, if like I make an extra couple hundred in, in two months, like it still pays for sticky pants. So I'm good. Um, but I mean, yeah, the, the monetization. Money's is, money, hey? Yeah. Like, um, you know, uh, so, so it's just being aware of like, um, that I cannot be totally stoic. The goal is not to be totally stoic here. The goal is to be like, um, so I don't like hearing certain things and I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm not going to tolerate it for y'all. So there's that. Um, I also limit who can message me. Um, that eliminates a lot of trolls. Um, and also like, you know, my platform has gotten bigger. So like, I cannot like, you know, I, I limited story replies. Um, only people I follow can reply to my stories because even though a lot of the messages are supportive and engaging, I cannot engage with everybody. And for me, I realized that was taking up a lot of mental space for me is that impulse to be like unread message. I got to respond to it. And so it's like 50 unread messages. And it's like, I already have all these unread emails. Now I got all these unread Instagram messages. That's what was stressing me out, Mm -hmm. you know? Not the not the nasty comments, which I get much more support than I get nasty comments. But for me, it's also like realizing that um, sometimes I have an impulse to respond. And when that impulse is going off, it's taking up taking up mental space. So I've just limited on with who I engage with. And that's what's made it much easier for me. I have to tell you a story. I've got a student um, who uh, wears hijab but she actually doesn't wear hijab during my classes, but she'll put them back. She puts it straight back on when she leaves. She, like like you said, she um, kind of, she um, picks and chooses the situations that she feels most comfortable to do what she feels like she wants to do. Um, and, you know, she practices, but she considers herself quite a relaxed Muslim. Um, and, you know, she, uh, she was talking to me about, she said, oh, I follow this person like who also wears hijab and does poll. I was like, 
I was like, I bet I know who that is. And it was just so funny, like, because we were talking about you and she said how inspiring your page was to her. And I just um, wanted you to know in case you haven't heard from, I'm sure, hundreds of people already. But yes, this is the impact that you're having. And I think it's so important. What do you feel is stopping more people in hijab joining poll? Do you think it is that sort of religious, like, suppression that people are facing where they feel like they maybe feel people within their religious groups would judge them for doing so? Or is there something else that you think is stopping them from coming? I think it's just because people still place a stigma on poll. And I think that is way beyond Muslim community. It's like, again, I see this in all communities. Um, you know, and that's why I try to make the point on my page. Um, I, you know, I, I'm very against like stripper erasure when I, any type, any type, I, anytime it comes to poll. And I make it very clear, like I have been trained by former strippers. There are multiple you know, and many times they are former strippers because it is very hard to be a stripper and it is not, there's a lot of abuse that comes with it. Um, so, you know, um, I, I think that like, I, that's what I learned very early on in my journey is not to approach this from, oh, I'm not doing stripper shit. Like, you know, this is not what stripper, I'm not, you know, I'm like, now I'm just like, why do you have a problem with strippers? Like, um, you know, even it just because the origin of something does not sit well with you, that does not mean that the whole thing can should be like uh, dismissed and stigmatized. Just don't be a stripper. Then if you want to do pole, but associated with stripping, then don't be a stripper if that's not something you want to do. That's it. I think you have such a um, progressive mindset. You're very like, yeah, that well, that's probably the best way to describe it. It's just so progressive. I love the way you think, and I love that you're so open to learning and understanding about different cultures and stuff. Where does that come from? Like, have you always been like that? I think it's because probably um, it, just from my own culture, it's like you know, I'm Iranian and I'm a practicing Muslim. I don't have a space in a lot of parts of my community because, understandably, Iranians have been traumatized by a government that tries to enforce religion you know uh similarly in the u.s like with um with christians or other people that call themselves christians trying to take away abortion rights in 14 states now you know a lot of people are angry with those kind of christians um you know it's similar in iran where a lot of people a lot of iranians don't understand why, like, I'm still a practicing Muslim, why I'm not against, you know, um, Islam entirely. Um, I think just being in situations where I'm practicing some things that a lot of people don't understand, I've just had to be okay with people not understanding it. Like, um, I think that with my journey, like, um, there's a lot of stuff that people are not going to understand because they just won't understand what it was like uh, growing up in my environment, for example, there's a lot of stuff about me that's probably paradoxical to a lot of people. Mm. And that's fine. Um, because there's a lot of stuff that if I try to explain, they're not going to get it either. And it's right. not my job. It's not my job to try to um, get them to understand if their um, locus of normalcy is very different from mine. So, you know, it's just I've just had to learn from a younger age that like there's a lot of stuff in my identity that is not going to make sense to people because they see it as contradictory. Um, yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying. I think it's such a valid point, I, but I love that you think that way and you seem to be very understanding of it as well. Like you said, it's, you may not understand it, but it's also not their job to understand because you don't care if they understand or not. So long as, so long as they accept that that's what you want to do, I think that's all that matters. And I think lots of us do sometimes forget that when we're quick to judge. Yeah. And I um, think like, I think the easiest way that I can uh, compare it to is when people grow up popular in high school, they grew up benefiting from a social hierarchy you know, and I think that it's a lot of the people that that were popular in high school that were so easily accepted that have a harder time coping in adulthood because they have not learned rejection. It's a privileged um, situation for me sometimes. It's very much, they're so used to having the privilege of being the popular person at school and always having people agreeing with them and never being challenged on their opinions. And when they leave that school situation, I totally understand what you mean. I feel like very similar with, you know, being a gay person and again, like being the bullied one at school and then seeing, you know, these 
kids that were popular and stuff living in a world where it doesn't really work like that mean girls isn't it doesn't carry on after school you know what i mean and you, yeah yeah no i i agree with everything you said and, and i love how how wise you are when you say it it's very I, I love the way you think when it comes to that sort of subject i really appreciate it and yeah. Your page you're using a lot at the moment for um, activism, which I think is amazing. How how do you uh, cope with that? And do you find that quite heavy? Like it must be quite a lot for you to sort of deal with in terms of not only having to post, but then like having to deal with the responses and like how, how do you find that? Um, I think the response has been mostly like grateful because I think that a lot of people just don't know what's happening in Iran because... I think that because the U.S. is trying to close a nuclear deal with Iran, that they are purposely not putting this on media outlets. So I think that a lot right. of people, you know, go to my page for information, which that's what I'm happy to do. But it's like it's you know, it's it still feels like a pretty helpless situation because like, you know, I mean, I'm I'm not there and it would be very unsafe if I ever tried to like visit Iran now, you know. Right. So I just feel like, you know, posting online is the least that I can do. Yeah, and I think it's so great that you're doing that. And thank you for all of the educational posts. I feel like actually that's one of the main things I get from your page is a lot of educational stuff and also the odd the odd funny posts which do make me laugh every now and then. Yeah, <laughs> I love how that. honest I love how honest you are with like your followers and you're like you'll always ask me like, Do you all do this or is it just me kind of thing? Mm. I love that. So what's what's next in the journey for Nada? What what um what's next on the journey for you? Carrying on with everything that you're doing on social media do you have any like goals for the next sort of five to ten years um I'm are you not teaching sure. already i mean for me i'm done with school i don't want to go back you know for like advancing my nursing education i've already peaked in what i want to <laughs> do i think that like you know if if let's say that like i advance like my uh pole skills i do want to teach eventually i think i'm good at teaching um and i think that like if I was ever in a city that was more affordable, I would consider opening a pole studio um, because that's that's what I would want to do um, is just try to learn the business side of things and mm. just learn what I got to do. But I do eventually want to become quali qualified enough to teach. Yeah, I think that's definitely a great goal for you. And would you ever consider, like, you know, we were talking earlier about having classes specifically for people in hijab. Would you ever consider doing something like that? Do you think there's a, a market for it? I think that I would um, leave an option for an all women's class, you know, and I would like, you know, put it under the condition that it's like um, everyone agrees not to post because yeah, of yeah. their privacy, which again, like, you know, I remember that was um, a Tuesday topic discussion as like the subject of all women's classes. Um, and some people were saying that it was like backwards or whatever. And I'm just like, like y'all got a lot of stuff in your in your culture that's back that a lot of people would consider backwards too. So yeah, I, I really like coming to your page to just put people in their place and not be like, yeah, yeah privilege. Like, well, <laughs> well, I'm gonna be really honest with you. Though a long, long time ago, I used to be the same. I used to be like, why does it have to be women only? You know what I mean? I didn't. Religion didn't even come into my head at the time, actually. And um, it's only really over the years I've thought, actually, I like that women have that space for themselves now. But it took it took some education. I'm going to be honest, like, I'm very happy to learn. You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't like learning through online hate. I'm going to be honest. I really don't respond well to that. But when people message me and say, hey, dad, like, actually, this is why I'm like, oh, I quite like that. And this is why I like your posts, because they are educational and they do allow people to you know ask stupid questions and you're really good with responding to them so i you know i thank you for that but yeah well thank you so much for coming on to my podcast and chatting to me and um sorry that your cats decide to rebel against this yeah. idea and do everything i don't know what your house is going to look like when you turn around after I this know. but it's possibly going to be a bit of a mess but yeah thank you so much for coming on and chatting to us and um please keep doing all the amazing work you're doing i love watching your posts and um i look forward to seeing more of them all right thank you so much this was really fun thank you so much nina take care thanks bye bye Hey, wait, before you go, I just want to quickly catch you a second because I'm running a little giveaway at the moment. If you go onto whichever platform you're listening to this to and give me five stars, screenshot it and send it to me, you'll be entered into a prize draw to win loads of Polo's goodies. So if you want to win some free shit, 
Go and give me five stars on whatever platform you're listening to me from. Send me a screenshot and you'll be entered into a prize draw to win some free stuff. So go and do it now and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye. That was all the tea that you can get this week. Join me next time right here. It's the Weekly Tea. Hey, what's up, you sexy bitches, and welcome to this week's Weekly D. I'm so excited to have you with me, and I'm excited to have our guest, Nada, also known as Hijabalicious, who I, for some reason, keep saying Hijabalicious. I don't know why I keep saying Hijabalicious. It's Hijabalicious. So if I do say it wrong in the episode, I do apologize. Um, Nada, thank you so much for coming onto this show. It was great to have spoken to you, and I learned a lot of stuff, and I know that you are all going to learn lots of stuff as well. So without further ado, this is the week. Weekly D, because honey, if you ain't getting your D on the daily, you better at least be getting it once on the weekly.